Hi, I'm Michael Feldstein. Welcome to eLiterate TV's series on personalized learning. In this series, we'll examine that term, which is heavily marketed but poorly defined in practice. What does it mean to personalize learning using technology? How is that different from what we do in the classroom today, and how is it the same? Why do we think that personalizing learning using technology will make the classroom better, and what reason do we have to believe that it will actually improve education? Before we look at schools that are trying out particular personalized learning technologies, we thought we'd start the series by visiting a place that is the kind of school that Americans probably think of first when they think of a high-quality personal education. Middlebury College, nestled in the mountains of rural Vermont, is the quintessential New England liberal arts college. With a student-teacher ratio of under 9 to 1, personalized learning is pretty much the air they breathe there, so much so, in fact, that it's not a term that occurs to them to use. It's not. Um, it's not one we use, but it's one that's embedded in how we think. I mean, faculty members, one of the challenges about technology is that it might depersonalize the already very personalized education that takes place here. And I think that's one of the challenges we face in introducing digital media and so forth into the um, curriculum. And that is that faculty pride themselves on the type of interactions that they create for students. That's why students come here. One of the things we say is, why bother coming to Middlebury if you're not ready to work side by side with a faculty member? Mm. It's one of the advantages of an 8.6 to 1 student-faculty ratio that there are faculty members who are available and ready to work with students. Uh, and as we said, the technology needs to enhance and facilitate that relationship and not get in the way of it. So where does technology fit into that? How do you create an environment in which students are engaged globally and free of distraction at the same time? Well, I think one of the opportunities is uh, for us to use technology, for example, video conferencing, and we are doing this with increasing frequency to connect students who are here on this campus to the many students and faculty at our locations. We have 36 sites abroad in 16 countries around the world. Uh, so in addition to the kinds of study, traditional study abroad experiences that our students and many other students have uh, at our sites, we can also let students take advantage of the kind of immediate connection to global environments that technology can allow uh, even if they are in their first year language class connecting with students who are juniors studying in Amman or in Beijing. Mm. We use technology, as Susan said, quite a bit, and we'll be using it a lot more. But for the part of a student's education, the reason they come here is to engage faculty. Mm -hmm. And so while in the classroom, you, you might get a traditional liberal arts education, but that's a foundation for many other things, including going abroad, including, including tying into our partner institutions abroad, and including just tying into the world of technology, information, and so forth. So I think it's a happy medium where the classroom experience should be probably computer free, except where needed. Um, but again, we're going to use technology more and more to enrich the environment. Mm. Well, I think one of the challenges is how do we use technology to enhance learning, and we have many examples of courses that do that very intentionally, but do it in a way that also doesn't interfere with the very immediate face-to-face -face interactions that students and faculty have and are really part of the DNA of what we do here. The, 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 the courses that Susan mentioned, language courses, where, it, where intro students learning Russian, for example, can tie into students who are more advanced in Moscow is one example. But about 55% of our students study abroad at partner institutions, most of them in language. Um, that means 45% of our students are not studying abroad. And so we use technology also to bring in those partner institutions to give all students, even those who are not specializing in Arabic or Russian or Chinese, the opportunity to hear what's going on in specific areas, in symposia, uh, in conferences, to hear what's going on in those countries and in those cultures, and it's hugely enriching for those students as well. When technology is brought into a Middlebury classroom, it's often part of a grassroots effort by individual faculty members who are coming to grips with technology-driven changes in their own scholarly work. Um, I am early in my career, um, but I think John and I were probably uh, attracted to Middlebury for the same reasons, mm -hmm. which is the ability to interact with these incredibly talented young people. Mm -hmm. And for them, 
this is part of their world, and I feel like it's a responsibility for it to be part of my world as well. Um, I teach international politics, mm. and um, as our mission statement of the college says, this is an inspirational setting in which to reflect on important problems. Um, but geographically, we're somewhat isolated from the rest of the country. Uh, Vermont is a relatively sparsely populated state, um, so for me to know what that global community looks like, mm. uh, I need to use the tools that I have through the internet, multimedia, communication, that sort of stuff. Um, so I feel like um, it is both my role as a scholar to mm. use that technology to help me learn about the things that I'll be teaching to my students, mm. and then to help them develop some skills um, so that they can use these tools that will help them communicate the critical thinking skills mm. that they've acquired here to a larger audience. Sometimes, due to the close personal relationships that Middlebury fosters between faculty and students, it's actually the students who teach the faculty about technology. Now, speaking of personal relationships with yeah. your professor, you, you two have worked together recently, yes? Yes. Can you tell me a little bit about that? Well, I retired from Middlebury four years ago after teaching here for 37 years, and since retiring as a professor of English and Environmental Studies, I've gotten interested in uh, digital approaches to teaching online teaching. And uh, last year, I decided I'd like to put up a website uh, as a way of publishing a memoir I had written that involved uh, music. Mm. So uh, the idea of the website appealed to me, but the technology was beyond me. So I applied to Middlebury to have a digital media tutor assigned to help me, and that was Denise, who helped me quite a lot because she has a great deal of expertise in this area, and it was, uh, it was both productive and a lot of fun to have that dialogue. So this was a pretty recent experience for you, and you've now, um, thanks to Denise, uh, you've done some more experimentation with technology in the classroom? Yes. Well, I've, um, I've also been, uh, the last two summers, involved in a, a Middlebury program called Foodworks, which is mm. a, a paid summer internship on local food systems, and next year, they want to offer it for college credit, I'll be the teacher. Mm -hmm. So I'm thinking about uh, various related um, online options, including uh, teleconferences with groups in different sites, and, and of course, uh, Skyping for personal uh, and small group conversations, uh, as well as face-to-face -face, mm -hmm. uh, learning. I'm interested not in online um, education as an alternative, but in blended education that, that involves online and personal connection. Why blended? Well, f for me, over, over my, my time teaching at Middlebury and at the Breadloaf School of English most summers as well, there were two goals, really, beyond the subject matter of a course. One was to have a class in which the process of discovery was important. And the second one was to, to cultivate a sense of educational community in which people mm -hmm. are very connected with each other, very interested in each other's ideas. Mm -hmm. And uh, my belief is that face-to-face -face personal contact is a good foundation for an online uh, uh, connection that, that feels equally uh, uh, supportive and uh, stimulating. So I think you really need both. And Well, perhaps you could do without both, but I think it's better to have both. Mm. That's my sense. Okay. Sometimes the students push the faculty to move faster. Well, one of the, um, the big ideas, I guess, in personalized learning is that face-to-face -face time should be used for, um, for things, for, for issues that, um, that it's best at, um, in the sense that if you're in a math class and you, um, you sit in that class and you watch the professor lecture the whole class, and supposing it's one of those classes where there's not a lot of communication during class, when you really, you know, could, you could be talking, Mm -hmm. um, people have come up with the idea of flipping that model on its head and having people watch lectures outside of class and then come into class and then work um, face to face with professors as they help them solve problems. Mm -hmm. um, that kind of um, that kind of innovation um, would require bigger steps, like you know, making it super easy to record lectures, mm -hmm. right, or making it super easy. Um, for students to get um, feedback through these kinds of quizzes, 
mm -hmm. um, without just kind of making it a form where you type in answers. Um, so I think the biggest gains are going to happen when um, when somebody has a you know big idea and then works hard to actually you know make it possible for for everybody and not just for Middlebury or you know one school. So part of what I hear you saying is that. Sure, there's a ratio of eight students to one teacher and the classes are small, but in those classes, sometimes the teacher's are doing the same thing that they would do in a class of 20 or 30 or, or 50, and uh, that maybe some of the teaching practices that aren't so personal uh, could change. Yeah, yeah, I mean, Middlebury has, whether or not there's a strict, like a, a lot of communication during lecture time, mm -hmm. um, Middlebury has unparalleled professors and unparalleled lectures given the, by those professors. But the ideas of, um, at least some of the ideas introduced by this new technology um, would really change the way we actually use that face-to-face -face time. On the surface, Middlebury College is the same as it ever was an elite small liberal arts college where student-teacher interactions are at the center of college life and technology is on the periphery. But increasingly, students and young faculty members are coming in with different ideas about technology, technology that they feel is a central part of their personal lives rather than an alienating intrusion. As we'll see in the next two episodes, this shift in attitudes means that technology is likely to play an increasingly important role in personalizing education even at a place like Middlebury.